So uh, thanks everyone for coming out. This is about five times the number of people I expected uh, at a world fantasy reading. So <laughs> thank you all, uh, especially people who don't know me. But, uh, thank you. Um, this is a, uh, the first in a series of stories set in colonial Brazil, 16th century. This was published in Realms of Fantasy in April of this year. Uh, there is a website associated with the series. It's eamb.org, and there's artwork on there and, and news and little snippets about the world. I tend to po put posts up there um, to explain different things about this world. I live in Brazil, which is how this came about. So I came up here for World Fantasy this week. And... Um, this particular story, it's a little bit different. It's basically in three different parts, and um, it's a type of origin story for these characters. And uh, in the first part is uh, the meeting. The second part switches uh, point of view, and it switches protagonist, and it's a flashback, and then it comes back to the their present in the third part. So it's kind of in three acts. And it's 10,000 words, so I'm not going to have time to read it all, but I'm going to try and read all through the first part. So. The Fortuitous Meeting of Gerard Van Oost and Oludara by Christopher Caston Smith. High atop the Church of the Immaculate Conception, in contrast to the subdued hues of the building's unpainted mortar and stone, a scarlet macaw perched upon a wooden cross. The macaw cocked its head from side to side, watching people move through Salvador's principal plaza. After a few minutes, it paused to stretch out its wings, presenting its full array of colors, scarlet, gold, sapphire, chalk, amber, and coal, a combination found nowhere else in nature. The flash of color caught Gerard's eye. He looked up and examined the macaw. The exotic bird symbolized everything which had brought him to this strange new world beauty, mystery, and magic. All thoughts of returning to Europe faded before the bird's gorgeous display. Certainly, that one sight alone, unknown to most European eyes, was in itself worth braving the six weeks' journey across the Atlantic. When the bird took flight, disappearing beyond the city's northern wall, Gerard returned his focus to the plaza. Out of habit, he tugged the bottom of his linen doublet, fitting it snugly around his broad chest. Then he stroked his palm-length goatee with his right hand and tapped the pommel of his Bolognese rapier with his left as he considered the problem at hand. He had come to Brazil under the assumption that anyone courageous enough to make the trip could earn a spot in one of the adventuring troops. But unfortunately, that had not been the case. Antonio Dias Caldas, the most renowned adventurer in the province, had firmly declined Gerard's services. And so far, no other group had stepped forward to explore the local wilds. Gerard could potentially raise his own standard, but he would need a strong team, and he hadn't met anyone in Salvador with whom he would trust his life. His thoughts were interrupted as the Portuguese merchant Pero de Belém walked by, leading a coffle of African slaves. Pero tipped his wide-brimmed hat as he passed, and Gerard responded in kind. The slaves followed one by one, heads held low, the chains joining their neck collars swaying between them. Their only clothing consisted of one-piece cotton tunics, which hung to their knees. The line came to an abrupt halt when one of the local mill owners stopped Pero to have a word with him. Gerard noticed that the nearest slave did not bend like the others. He stood completely erect. Already a few inches taller than average, his posture made him tower above the rest. His bulging muscles stood out, even through the unfitted tunic. The man exuded power and grace, and his eyes held a certain deepness. His wide nostrils and high cheekbones only heightened the effect. Gerard could only think of one word to describe the man, magnificent. He l lamented the fact that men were taken from their homeland in chains. Gerard grimaced as the depressing sight cast a shadow over the idyllic image he had formed just moments before. And so, even in paradise, they are slaves, he said. The slave turned toward him but did not make a sound. Gerard looked away, embarrassed, wondering if the man might have understood his remark. Trumpets sounded from the north gate, drawing away his attention. Shouts erupted from all around the plaza as Antonio Diaz Caldas strode through the gate with a native carrying his golden red standard close by his side. 
Behind him followed his band. Gerard counted 40 in all, many less than had started the mission a few weeks before. Without breaking stride, Antonio crossed the plaza to the governor's palace. The rest of his men dispersed in the square, each one quickly surrounded by curious bystanders. Diogo, one of Antonio's men whom Gerard held in high esteem, passed nearby. Diogo, asked Gerard, what happened? We killed the boy Tata. The serpent that's been attacking the farmers? Tell me more. We've heard only rumors here. It was truly a magnificent creature. During the day, it hid in lakes and rivers, so we had to hunt it at night. It took days to corner it, but when we finally did, we discovered a serpent large beyond belief, as wide as a cart and long as a mainmast, I swear. Its body blazed with the magical blue flame which burned beast but not bush, and which no water could douse. The flame made the beast appear blue, but when we cast light upon it, its scales shone with all the colors of the rainbow. Its eyes were giant balls of fire, Diogo continued, each the size of a skull. Two of our companions, Alfonso and Paulo, made the mistake of looking the beast in the eye. Both of them went mad. The boy Tata burned and struck as we fought it, killing everything it touched. But that is all I can tell for now. Antonio will want to tell the de details of the victory himself after he collects the governor's reward. And the recognition. Gerard pr practically sighed as he said it. Then he asked, it appears you lost some men? Yes, we lost 10 during our encounter with the beast. Then I suppose you'll be looking to fill your ranks. Diogo frowned without responding. Diogo, Gerard, con Gerard continued, you know I want to serve under a standard more than anything. I didn't spend six weeks cramped in a caravel just to visit a mortar and bamboo village. I came here for adventure. I have the strength of a bear and I'm one of the best harquebus shots you'll ever meet. I know Antonio respects you. Please help me. I don't know if there's anything I can do, Gerard. We still have 20 harquebusiers, more than enough for anything left roaming these parts. But your biggest problem is that Antonio isn't fond of Protestants. I'm not going to convert to Catholicism just to join your band. And it wouldn't help, came a voice to his right. I'm not fond of converts either. Gerard turned to see Antonio approaching, his chest jutting forward under his rich blue doublet and his black beard cropped close around his long chin. Go back to Gerard, or go back to Europe, Gerard, said Antonio. You're not wanted here. I formally requested that Governor Almeida have you arrested for vagrancy if you're not on the next ship out. Given his delight at my defeat of the boy Tata, I have every re expectation my request will be granted. I didn't know vagrancy was a crime in Brazil, Gerard replied through clenched teeth. It is if the governor says so. Gerard breathed deeply before responding. I'm willing to risk my life in your service and you treat me this way? I don't need your help, Gerard. Then he paused. Although there could be a way, a man who can think on his feet is worth a do dozen harquebusiers. Brazil is filled with all types of wily creatures, and many times a sharp wit is more useful than a sharp sword. If you can guess how we defeated the boy Tata, I'll withdraw my request for your arrest and consider a place for you in my band. Gerard pulled on his goatee. Quick decisions were not his specialty, and being forced to make one muddled his thoughts. He wiped the sweat from his forehead. Time's up, said Antonio. Any ideas? Gerard had no idea how much time had passed. He'd worried the entire time, never managing to concentrate on the problem. Mm, he said, I don't know. A serpent is best defeated through its stomach. All three men turned to see who had spoken. The African accented Portuguese made the speaker undeniable. The voice had come from the nearby slave. How did you know that, shouted Antonio. I told the story to Governor Almeida just five minutes ago. Pero de Belém came running. What's going on here, he yelled. Is this slave babbling something? He held his face close to the slaves and said, Uga Booga. Actually, said Gerard, he appears to speak perfect Portuguese. Oh, right, Pero said, scratching his beard. That one. I can never tell them apart. He's the only one of these monkeys who speaks Portuguese, and he gave me a mouthful too much of it on the way from Africa. Do not call us monkeys, said the slave. We are not animals. You who take men from their homelands and sell them like vegetables are the animals. 
But I comprehend your denial, Mr. Pero de Belém, and I pity you. If you ever truly accept what it is you do, it will haunt you for the rest of your life. See what I mean, Pero said, holding up his hands. He turned his attention back to the slave. No one asked for your opinion, and one more word out of you will get you a lashing tonight. That won't be necessary, interrupted Gerard, not wanting to see any harm come to the man. He just responded to a question. He appears to be quite a remarkable man. Really, said Pero, squinting his eyes. Well, if you think he's so wonderful, I can sell him to you. He's supposed to be shipped down to Fernando Alvaro's sugar mill in Rio de Janeiro on Thursday. But if you give me 40,000 rays before then, I can settle something else with Fernando. 40,000? That price is absurd. What was it you called him again? Remarkable? Well, that just means you have to pay a remarkable price. And don't think Fernando is going to give him up once he lays his hand on him either. Five of his slaves were killed in Indian attacks last month, and he's eager to fill the ranks with fresh fodder. Pero turned back to the lion and yelled, Move out! Antonio burst out laughing. See, Gerard, he said, you're not clever enough for an expedition like ours. Even a slave just arrived from Africa knows more than you. He walked off chuckling. Diogo placed a hand on Gerard's shoulder. I'm sorry, Gerard. Antonio's words are often unnecessarily brusque. Gerard watched the line of slaves moving away. Not at all, he replied. I think he may be right. 